to the end, because we're running a bit late to start with. Uh, I think it's good to point out that we are, all the projects have been asked to work very closely with the traditional owners, both for permission to get on country. We're also really trying to raise the level of uh, ability within the traditional owner groups. I think Alex will talk about some of the training they've been doing in terms of dolphin surveys. And part of the idea, one of the projects we're running is trying to uh, find projects that the traditional owners, the range groups are interested in doing, uh, to collect data for themselves. So something we can talk more about. Alex? Thank you, Stuart. Um, thanks, everyone, for your patience with the, the slow start. Um, I'm probably not going to catch up much time, but I'll have to go if I can. My name is Alex Brown, and I'm a researcher with Murdoch University Citation Unit. And I'm going to kick us off today presenting a couple of elements of this project um, that we've collaborated with Curtin University and the Australian National University on, uh, looking at the relative abundance, population, genetic structure, and passive acoustic monitoring of snub fin and humpback dolphins in the Kimberley region. Sorry, just to acknowledge all my co-authors there. Um, quite a lot of people involved in this project. It was quite a big collaboration. So I'll start off just introducing the study species. Some of you are probably somewhat familiar with these. Um, we have the Australian snub fin and Australian humpback dolphin. Um, both species are unique to the coastal, shallow coastal waters of northern Australia and parts of southern New Guinea. Um, so they have a fairly restricted um, global distribution. Um, the IUCN have given them both a precautionary near-threatened um, status. They don't, they're kind of data deficient really, but based upon the apparent low numbers and limited distribution, that's what they've been given. Um, they're both being reassessed at the moment as new information comes to light. And uh, a recent paper recommended that the Australian humpback dolphin is considered vulnerable on account of the um, likely fragmented distribution and low numbers that have been found in today. Under um, national legislation, the EPBC Act, they're listed as migratory and cetacean, which means they are considered matters of national environmental significance. Um, so any activity that may have a significant impact on them needs to be referred to the Department of Environment um, for a full assessment. Despite this relatively high standing, there, there is insufficient data for the Threatened Species Commission to perform a full assessment and see if they qualify as vulnerable or endangered or anything else under the EPBC Act. Research to date um, has been limited but has increased quite a lot in recent years. Um, from the east coast of Australia and a few studies in Western Australia, um, a couple in the Northern Territory now as well, they seem to occur in fairly small local populations of between 50 and 200 animals, 200 more sort of exceptional near the upper end. Um, fairly fragmented distribution of local populations with evidence of limited gene flow between those. Uh, they appear to be fairly reliant on near shore shallow habitats um, such as estuaries, sheltered bays, uh, and because of that um, distribution and low numbers, um, that exposes them to a lot of human activities in the coastal zone. So they are vulnerable to a variety of human activities. So the research need and application here is that we really do need greater information on the distribution, abundance and trends in abundance, um, the population genetic structure of these animals, and also the threats to them. And that will give us more informed assessments of A, their conservation status, um, the potential impacts that could arise from activities in their habitat, and give us more informed management plans. Um, this is particularly important in areas such as the Kimberley where we've seen um, a wealth of new marine parks um, coming through the system soon. So where these species are listed as key values of the marine parks, it's important to have a better understanding of them and, and how um, they interact with other uses of the parks. There's also a need for new research techniques, uh, particularly where species such as these occur in very remote and often inaccessible areas, so um, there's a real need to develop more efficient research um, and monitoring tools, um, particularly given the finite resources that are available for research. So there are three main elements to this research project, population genetic structure, relative abundance and passive acoustic monitoring. Now I'm going to focus on the population genetic structure and relative abundance. That's the stuff that was done by um, Murdoch University. And my colleagues from Curtin and Murdoch will describe the passive acoustic monitoring in the next segment. So the aims of this um, for population genetic structure was to collect samples from free-ranging dolphins across the Kimberley and estimate measures of population differentiation and gene flow between different sampled areas. 
from this infer movements, uh, movement patterns of animals and identify different population subdivisions for management purposes. The relative abundance was kind of a secondary objective. Um, we really focused on obtaining tissue samples for genetic analyses, but while we were out there, we continued to collect um, information on encounter rates, species composition, and the number of um, photographically identifiable individuals where possible. We took this data and um, aimed to compare it to other sites which had been previously surveyed in the Kimberley to give us an idea of the relative importance of different areas to these species. So to give a bit of a background to um, Murdoch's activities in the Kimberley um, under different projects and how the WAMT1 fits in, since 2012 um, we've been collecting data at a number of sites, the ones highlighted in green there, um, which was part of my PhD project funded by the Commonwealth Government and WWF Australia. Then uh, we've added um, those red sites recently, which uh, were funded by WAMSI, and then the blue one there in Yampi Sound was surveyed recently as part of a collaboration between myself and the Danbury and Gary Rangers. It's more of a ranger training trip, but we were able to collect a couple of genetic samples as well. So. The Kimberley is a, a remote and inaccessible area to work in and um, it would have been impossible had we not been able to work closely with um, local stakeholders such as aquaculture operators in the area, traditional owners and also regional parks and wildlife management teams. So at Cone Bay we were um, supported um, by Marine Produce Australia, the, um, the aquaculture operators there, the Barramundi Farm who put us up and provided a really good logistics base. And then we collaborated with the Danbury and Gary Rangers there, who came up and joined us <coughs> on the second boat. Um, and we had some crew exchange and, and ad hoc training as we went. Then um, the Cambridge Gulf uh, trip in the far eastern Kimberley um, was quite a logistical undertaking. We set up a camp um, for, two, three, four, for five or six people at, a, at an island, a cross island, which was about 100 kilometres by boat from the nearest town of Wyndham. So um, it was a lot of equipment to arrange being dropped off up there, and we really were um, helped out immeasurably by the East Kimberley's um, vessel, the Jewinian, which served as a bit of a barge for taking all of our equipment up there. Then we collaborated with the Ballingarra Rangers and used their six metre vessel as our main survey boat. So the picture there is myself and Simon, who's over there, my colleague, being dumped at a deserted island with um, goodness knows how many tons of fuel and water and camping equipment and food, which was a bit unnerving, but other people arrived the next day. Um, this project uh, tied in with a ranger training project that I'm involved with, um, and we did a day of um, training in Wyndham with several of the Ballingara rangers, and then we had two of them, plus a ranger coordinator out with us at all times on the trip, so we had a lot of hands-on training in um, camera operation, species identification, and, and data collection. Then the last Wamsi trip was uh, to the Prince Regent River, a really inaccessible spot, and here we were fortunate in being able to um, hop aboard the Parks and Wildlife vessel, the Warndom, the one which um, Andy worked from and again collaborate with um, Dan and Gary Rangers who are part of the joint management team for the Langaram Marine Park. That was kind of a luxury cruise at the end of the, end of the, the season. So, um, on to the population genetic structure methods. Uh, some work was done during my PhD. Uh, I've got pictures of sample sizes there at some different locations in the, the Pilbara. I'm kind of referring to these two areas as the the Pilbara, I know the Northwest Cape is in the Gascoigne, strictly speaking, but I'm just simplifying it here. Um, so we, we did some level of um, genetic analyses uh, in a paper which was published in 2014, but a real objective for the WAMSI project was to um, collect samples from further east in the Kimberley. We'd only really done the Dampy Peninsula so far, so we really wanted to try and branch out into those more remote areas and collect additional samples. So we collected samples from small vessels, approaching animals to within about ideally 20 or 15 metres, and using a um, remote biopsy darting system, small plastic darts with a metal cutting head with barbs, um, bounces off the side of the dolphin, leaves a small wound which heals within a couple of weeks, um, no evidence of ongoing behavioural um, responses, then that provides us with a nice little plug of skin and blubber, and from that we're able to extract DNA so DNA is extracted and amplified in, in a lab, um, 
then from this we look at two different markers, mitochondrial markers, which are inherited um, from the mother, um, and assigned haplotypes to those. I'm not going to talk too much about those. They are a, a more slowly evolving um, type of DNA. They're very good for studies of um, phylogeny, but um, what I'm going to focus on more is the um, more rapidly rotating <coughs> nuclear markers, or microsatellites as we call them. These are inherited from both sets of parents. From those, um, we use several programs to look at different measures of population genetic structure, looking at gene flow and differentiation between areas. So the snubfin dolphins we, we got for, for uh, the sample sizes for snubfin dolphins, uh, we were able to increase our sample sizes um, from Robot Bay and Signet Bay to quite good numbers. Uh, we had some success at Cone Bay with 11 samples. And uh, the shorter trips, um, just a week or so to Yampi Sound and Prince Regent River, unfortunately only yielded a couple of samples. So we're limited with what we can do with those. When we looked at um, the measures of genetic differentiation, um, we found, uh, don't worry too much about the numbers here, these are the FST scores, but the number of stars indicates the level of significance of the differentiation. So Signet Bay and Roebuck Bay, as we've known previously, were significantly differentiated, but we added more confidence to those results with additional samples. Cone Bay and Roebuck Bay uh, were strongly differentiated, and then the, the closer two sites of Cone Bay and Signet Bay um, were not significantly differentiated, so they're separated by about 60 kilometres of water. Um, so yeah, a lack of differentiation there. Then we looked at the, um, the Bayesian clustering program um, structure and the results of that. So to help you interpret this, it's very colourful, but what you're looking at is each um, vertical bar represents a different individual dolphin, and then the y-axis is the proportion of membership to different clusters. So the program analyses the data and then suggests the most likely number of clusters that your data conform to. In our case, for snuffin dolphins, it was five. Although, as you can see from the colours there, it's, it's primarily three different clusters. So we've got big differences between Roebuck Bay and Signet Bay, although there is a fair amount of, of mixing there. Um, Cone Bay and Signet Bay were relatively similar, as we might expect from the other result. And what was quite interesting was this strong partitioning of one Cone Bay individual and then the, the populations further east at Yampi Sound and Prince Regent River. So, Limited sample size, but it's perhaps suggestive of some of the third um, genetic population further to the east. When we looked at the, um, the contemporary migration rates, um, we found similar results to what we did in 2014, despite the increased sample size. Very low rates of um, migration within the past few generations between Roebuck Bay and Signet Bay. The sample size wasn't big enough for it for us to look at, at Cone Bay as well. So the, the statistic there is the, um, the proportion of animals at one site derived from the other site per generation. Now, they're both below 10%, and 10% is uh, a commonly used sort of cutoff point for demographic isolation of different populations. When we looked at humpback dolphins, uh, we incorporated the samples previously from the Pilbara sites, we were able to add one more sample to our Signet Bay tally, and we collected 12 samples from Cone Bay, um, which was our, our main sort of additional collection. Then uh, one lonely sample from the Berkeley River in the Cambridge Gulf region as well. When we looked at differentiation, um, we found it was highly significant between the uh, Kimberley site of Cone Bay and either of those um, Pilbara sites. It was also significant between the, um, the two Pilbara sites, as we found previously, but you can see the score is, is very, very low, and it was, it was more weakly significant between the two. And that's confirmed by our, our structure population assignment results, where it suggested that the most likely number of clusters was two. Um, so we've got strong partitioning between the Pilbara and the Kimberley, so it really does look like those are two sort of separate genetic populations. Um, there was a bit of a plateau in the likely number of clusters above two, so I'll show you the results for three clusters and four as well. So we see at, at higher values of K, um, we started to see a bit of differentiation between Signet Bay and Cone Bay, um, but there was still this clear um, distinction between the Pilbara and the Kimberley, and no clear distinction between those two sites down in the Pilbara as well. Um, when we looked at the contemporary migration rates, very, very low levels between those two regions, the Pilbara 
and the Kimberley. And comparatively, we can look at that door between those two pilgrim sites of the Northwest Cape and the Dampier Archipelago. And um, it's quite an interesting result. It seems to be very directional movement of animals, with um, greater than 10% of animals at the Northwest Cape derived from the Dampier Archipelago, as you might expect, as the Northwest Cape's kind of on the edge of their distribution, but little to no movement whatsoever in, in the other direction. So the conclusions for population genetic structure would be um, strong differentiation between robot-based snubfins and those in Signet and Cone Bay. Um, so our conclusion from 2014 remains that you should really manage the snubfin dolphins in Robot Bay as, as a largely isolated population. And we saw some evidence of a potential third genetic population from Yampi Sound onwards. For humpback dolphins, there was strong differentiation between the Pilbara and the Kimberley, um, and some potential structure among the Kimberley sites, but we had limited sample sizes, so there was, there was not too much we could say about that. Overall, we, we did struggle with sample sizes. It is quite challenging to get close enough to these animals to get samples from them. Um, so we do need more to further investigate this, but it, it is challenging and it does require several weeks of effort with trained teams in order to get yourself near the double figures of samples that you'd need to be able to do meaningful analyses. Also going forward, looking at more advanced genetic techniques such as single um, nucleotide polymorphisms will probably provide a greater level of detail in that population structure. I'm pretty much out of time here, so I'll mention... Where's Stuart? How am I doing? Couple, uh, couple, three, four minutes. Three, four minutes, okay. So um, we collected data in relative abundance while we were going as well. Um, so from the, sm the small vessels we were using, um, visual surveys often following predetermined transect lines. Um, gr dolphin groups were sighted, approached. Um, we recorded group size, composition, um, location. We also recorded every kilometre of effort that we spent searching for animals so that we could come up with a an encounter rate of dolphins per kilometre of survey effort. Also, where possible, we collected photo identification images, so looking at distinctive marks on the fins of animals and picking out the number of individuals from those rather than just the number of dolphins observed per kilometre of effort. Um, so the encounter rates for snuffing dolphins, quite low in the new sites that we, we visited. Actually, not too bad. So. For comparisons here, we know Robot Base supports an abundance of about 140 or so snubfin dolphins, so a very high relative abundance. Signet Bay has 50 or 60, quite high as well, so all the values were below that, um, but it was re moderate for, um, for Cone Bay. The number at the top there is for the broader Prince Regent River area, but in the actual river itself, it was quite a bit higher, so that seemed to be the more important area for snubfins within that region. Um, for humpback dolphins, it's quite low. It's certainly lower than snubfins pretty much everywhere we've been. Um, again, similar sort of numbers to what we found at Signet Bay, where we know there's to be a population between sort of 15 to 20 overall. So the um, results of relative abundance, we, we found um, quite a lot of variability in the um, approachability of dolphins and therefore the success in obtaining both biopsy samples and um, useful photographs of dorsal fins, they often show quite strong avoidance behaviour towards, towards the vessels. So just here is a little statistic, um, this is a percentage of dolphins we successfully photographed versus those we came across, um, and we can see it was really very low for the Cambridge Gulf, um, reasonable for Cone Bay and um, intermediate for the Prince Regent River, and I've thrown in Signet Bay there as an example of, of what a successful site looks like. So. We were somewhat limited by what we could do um, with the photo ID data beyond Cone Bay. Um, there does seem to be some correlation with the amount of exposure animals have to small vessel traffic. Um, Cone Bay has an aquaculture operation. Animals are routinely here, small vessels coming and going that have no interest in the dolphins. The same can be said for Signet Bay as well, where um, there's pearl farming and also um, tour vessels going between the islands and the bay. Cambridge Gulf receives very little recreational vessel traffic by comparison. So we had a total of 27 and 18 snubfin and humpback dolphins photo identified over um, two trips that we made there. And um, here the numbers represent the one animals only seen in 2014, only in 2015, and then the area of overlap of those that were seen in both years. So the majority of animals of both species were seen in both 
both years, which provides some evidence of site fidelity to an area, which is what we've seen in other locations as well for these species. The rate of new identifications um, suggested that some snubfins still hadn't been identified there. We, we kept finding new ones um, as we went out and did more surveys. Uh, I'm pretty much out of time, but the, within the Prince Regent River, we, we found a, a fair few snubfin and humpback dolphins. We were working with the, the regional staff there, the crew of the Warndon, um, who are keen to um, set up a monitoring, an ongoing monitoring program for dolphins in this area, which receives um, quite high intensity of gillnet effort at times. And um, during the dry season, plenty of um, commercial tour vessels and also private um, recreational vessels um, typically do stop off in there as they pass through the Kimberley to take in the waterfalls and, and observe the, the wildlife. So um, they're going to annually report on relative abundance, um, photo ID data, and hopefully continue to collect some further biopsy samples opportunistically. Now this isn't going to give us um, really the level of information we need to detect slight changes in abundance of animals there, but it, it should detect any catastrophic declines and any real issues um, that management intervention might be required for. And um, it will facilitate um, investigation of longer term site fidelity if the monitoring continues over five or ten years as they plan to do so. So these results really kind of highlight the importance of Roebuck Bay and Signet Bay to snuffing dolphins. Um, Cone Bay also seems to support small local populations of both species and that's going to be important information with the increased um, access to the Kimberley as the uh, Cape Levite Road gets tarmac um, and a lot more recreational vessels will be, will be using that area and also as aquaculture operations um, expand in the Cone Bay area. So much more. Um, yeah, overall, um, the success of this really was um, critical um, in terms of, well, we, it was very important for us to collaborate with regional wildlife managers, traditional owners, and, um, and local stakeholders, such as industry operators in the area. And I think the, the acknowledgements um, acknowledge them in, in a large part, um, as well as the traditional owners who helped out with data collection, people who supported the genetic analyses and um, co-funders of the work. So, I will now pass you over to who's next? Chandra? Yeah. We'll take over and talk about some acoustics. Monitoring um, is a joint effort, and we've been re really lucky to work in a fantastic team up in Roebuck Bay. And then Josh obviously worked with um, all the rest of the Murdoch team up in Signet Bay. So I'll just mention briefly passive acoustic monitoring. I don't know how, how many people are familiar with it. it. It can be used quite successfully in different locations. The advantage of it is that you can literally put an acoustic logger in. You leave it, you come back a year later, if you're able to program your logger for that long, and then you pull it out and then you can analyze your data. However, there are limitations with passive acoustic monitoring as well, and so it's very much a technique that's in development. Currently, it is used successfully for a number of species, so baleen whales are one of the key ones. You can readily identify the sounds that they make quite easily, and so passive acoustic monitoring is used for looking at occurrence, of animals in a location, their distribution, if you have multiple receivers, you can look at different locations where they occur. Looking at migratory timing, if you've got a species that moves uh, long distances and where they appear at consecutive times. And then also, if you actually have an array of receivers, you can track the animals through space. So again, you can have fixed sensors, single ones, you can have multiple ones, you can have an array that's actually towed through the water as well. So, although it's an increasingly accessible tool because it's cost effective, um, or increasingly cost effective, it is under continued development. And so one of the areas where it has not been tested is on humpback dolphins and snuffin dolphins. So our main aim was to do exactly this. So the objectives of this section were to first of all understand the underwater acoustic environment. 
So to be able to test a method, the first thing you need is actually, okay, well, what's the sound environment like? Is there a lot of potential masking? In other words, if, our, if there's too much noise in the same frequencies that we produce noise, we can't hear it to be able to detect dolphins. And then the next step was to look at the correlation between acoustic and visual uh, surveys, so detections of dolphins, to see whether they match up. And of course, we need to know a lot more about the animals themselves and how they use sound. So how often they're vocalizing and the behavioral context. Josh will be talking a lot about that. And he also has looked at assessing ge geographical variation. So I'll just leave it with Sarah now to talk about uh, the environment, the underwater acoustic environment. And they stick out Okay, so I'm going to be explaining a little bit about what we found about the um, soundscape of Robot Bay and Signet Bay. So first I'll take you through how we collected that data. This is one of the high frequency acoustic recorders that um, is built at CMSD at Curtin University. And unfortunately I was expecting a much bigger screen. But how it worked was we had the logger down on the seabed and it was linked to a weighted line coming along the seabed here. It was then had a riser line going up to a surface float. And that mooring design was intended to try and decouple noise from the mooring from the acoustic receiver, so we're not picking up our own sounds. Uh, the receiver was recording 10 minutes of every 15 minutes at a sampling frequency of 192 kilohertz. In Signet Bay, it was deployed once in May of 2014, collecting 305 hours of acoustic data. Whilst in Robot Bay, we deployed it twice. So once in July, and then again in September, October of 2014, collecting 940 hours of acoustic data. So our first step in analyzing the soundscape was to um, review weekly spectrograms of those different soundscapes. And we did that using a tool called Tor, called Course, which is um, a map lab toolbox developed by staff at CMST. So for example, what we have here is week two of the Signet Bay data set. So we've got dates along the bottom here, and up the side, we've got different frequencies. And you can see there's a couple of different patterns in there that are interesting. So for example, what we have along the top in the black box is snapping shrimp. The little shrimp is making very impulsive snapping type sounds. We also have some fish choruses. So you can imagine like a songbird dawn chorus. We also get fish choruses occurring in the evening. Several different species produce different sounds. So we've got four examples of different sound types here when lots of fish have got together to produce their sounds at once. And you can see how some of these, for example, fish one is repeated throughout the week, again and again. And we've also got um, some vessel noise occurring too that again is repeated during the week, typically during the day. So having looked through both Robot Bay and Signet Bay, we could say that snapping shrimp were by far the most prevalent sound source in, this, in these soundscapes. Fish courses were, however, the most prominent sounds. So we recorded six different fish sounds at Robot Bay, and uh, three of those we recorded again in, in Signet Bay, along with an additional sound source. But in comparison to these biological sound sources, the man-made noise was relatively infrequent. We did have some um, noise from cyclone moorings in Robot Bay, so where the logger was situated is between a rocky ledge and an area of cyclone moorings, and we could hear the movement noise from those mooring chains. We had some broadband noise from vessels coming through both sites, um, and in Roebuck Bay, we had the most kind of vessel noise happening in the July deployment compared to September or October. We didn't see sounds from dolphins in these week-long uh, spectrograms, but that's because the sounds that the dolphins are producing are very short and very transient. They're not getting together like all the fish and hundreds of individuals all calling at once, which is why we couldn't pick them up that way, but we could by going through it at finer resolution. In Robot Bay, we also had a look at broadband noise levels, so how noisy was this site? And we did that for each 10 minute recording, and we found there was some temporal variability in the noise levels in Robot Bay. So this occurred in a daily basis. In the evenings, when all the fish started calling, the noise levels really picked up, which makes sense. We also found that um, the July deployment was slightly noisier than the September October deployment. And I'm throwing these numbers up here, and I know there's not much context, so to compare it to one of my other study sites, my PhD, which was in Fremantle and Harbour, you can see that the Robot Bay is quite a, a quieter environment compared to this urban site in Frio. So what we could say from all this is that Robot Bay and Signet Bay um, were predominantly composed of biological sound sources, and 
the anthropogenic man-made noise was quite was occurring at quite low levels. When it did occur, however, it was intense and considerably elevated the broadband noise levels. And that peak we saw in July in Roebuck Bay is probably reflecting increased tourism at the time of year. How does this relate back to our dolphins? Well, dolphins are mostly producing sound just above one kilohertz. And the man-made noise and fish sounds were below this level, so not um, really affecting the dolphins much. The snapping shrimp clicks did occur above one kilohertz, but just being that short impulsive sound is probably not going to uh, mask or influence dolphin acoustics much. So really, it seems that Robot Bay and Signet Bay are relatively pristine and quiet acoustic environments, which makes them really good sites for trying out the passive acoustic monitoring, which I'm going to pass back to Chandra and Joss now to talk about a bit more. <laughs> Okay, so um, so I'll just start by talking about um, Robert Bay. <clears throat> so this is looking at the vocal detections in relation to dolphin abundance. So we basically designed a set of transects that we were going to traverse using a vessel, and we decided to put an acoustic logger in a particular area where we knew there were going to be high numbers of dolphins in that area and high occupancy. So you'll see the, the black box. So that um, black box is basically the acoustic uh, detection area. Now this area was designed based on previous work uh, by other authors and other locations on dolphins that have estimated that detection ranges might be around one kilometer. It obviously depends on the types of sounds that they're, they're producing and also the environment. So that area on either side of the receiver and the green dot right in the middle is just a bit above one kilometer. We also designed some surveys to, to cover the broader area. I'm going to just focus on this small um, box area that uh, was then compared with the acoustic detections. So it was designed basically so that we would have a high probability of coverage and equal coverage in that area. We used uh, distance to be able to design those surveys to do that. We also uh, took some handheld measurements from the vessel while we were there. And what we did with the acoustic logger is we set it so that it recorded 10 minutes every 15 minutes. And it did that basically for the entirety of July. So I'll be talking about only July. Okay, so we were able to do 16 days of vessel surveys on the different transects. You can see the different transects, and again, you can see it within that small box. Those are the three smaller transects, and then these larger ones are for the broader area. Now that small box area, you would have noticed as well in that map, in the bathymetry, it was a deeper area. So that specifically was chosen to maximize our area of detection. Uh, for acoustic propagation, you want deep areas if you can. So during that period, we sighted 370, we had 375 dolphin sightings, and people always get confused with this. So I've said it the wrong way before, and people say, my gosh, there are a thousand dolphins in Swan River. Those of you who work with Swan River dolphins know definitely that's not true. So, side teams, um, not animals. And as Alex said before, um, it's, it's more on around 150 animals in that uh, population. Okay. We also saw uh, some bottlenose dolphins and some hum humpback um, dolphins. However, those numbers were a lot fewer. So snubfin was really what we were seeing. In the acoustic... Um, detection area, we also sighted quite a large number, so 109 sightings we had, but only of snubfin dolphins within 32 groups. So what did we detect acoustically? We know what we detected visually. What was our rate of detection? 67% of surveys that had a visual detection, <coughs> we also had an acoustic detection. That's actually pretty good. It's more than I expected, to be honest. So I was very excited going through the, the data and seeing those uh, rates. Now looking back at the surveys that did not have an acoustic detection corresponding to them, those were actually when only a single group was sighted. And not only that, three out of four of them were only the single animal. And you can imagine, of course, if it's a single animal, it may be spending less time in that area. It's not socializing or cooperatively foraging in that area. It might be actually transiting through from one location to another. And Josh is going to enlighten us on all of that in a moment. 
Okay, so of the three sound types, so there are sort of three broad sound types that we categorized. The easiest to recognize are whistles, of course, which are used for communication. Those are a bit lower in frequency compared to the echolocation uh, sounds. The echolocations are basically the, the sonar that they use. So it was echolocation that actually we were seeing most. Those are much higher in frequency. So in terms of talking about PAM, then you start to think, okay, well, do I want to set my loggers to be able to measure that higher <coughs> frequency, or do I want to save battery in space and actually set it to a lower frequency? So I, depending on what you're doing, but high frequency is good. Okay, now during the targeted handheld, so we're literally going on a boat, see a group of dolphins, and we drop the hydrophone when we can, switch the motor off, <coughs> drop the hydrophone, on these, with the snubfin dolphin interactions, we detected all of the animals that were within visual range, they're relatively close. But for the few interactions, the hand, which is literally three or four, of these ones with bottlenose and humpback, we didn't. They're fast moving. So these animals were transiting. No chance. And again, that really goes to show that it's so important to think about Basically, what are the detection ranges and how long are they going to be spending in that area to be able to detect them? So I'll just give very brief conclusions. Just to this bit, Josh is going to give a full conclusions to the passive acoustic monitoring section. So PAM was effective at monitoring occurrence of snubfin dolphins over 90% of the time at a high use area in Roebuck Bay when groups were greater than one individual. Joshua mentioned passive acoustic monitoring as a powerful uh, high resolution temporal scale uh, detection technique. There was no direct correlation between number of acoustic samples, so those 10 minute samples that we got every 15 minutes, and group size or the numbers of uh, dolphins that we saw visually. But of course what we do need to take into consideration are the fact that depending on their behavioral context and their group size, they may be vocalizing at different rates. So in that future work should be actually to then model detection rates based on all those different levels of input. So that includes looking at their behavior, looking at the duration of acoustic detections as well. We're only looking at each record at a time, each 10 minute, minute record, and also looking at group size and then looking at the range in which they were detected. So it can be that we were actually detecting them in less than one kilometer. So we do need to establish that, and we can do that through propagation, acoustic propagation techniques. And finally, we collected a wealth of data that included photo ID and abundance information that we can analyze in the future as part of a different project. Okay, I'll hand over to Josh. Sorry guys, I know, I know you all want to you know, get out of here as soon as possible, so I'm going to make this uh, relatively quick and cut down a little bit of the detail, but not of the actual content. Okay, so what I'll be talking about is essentially the types of sounds that they were using and the behaviors that they were using uh, within, and that's a, one of the fundamental components other than what type of environment they're producing these sounds in. Um, when applying passive acoustic monitoring as a survey tool. So looking at just the acoustic reptile and behavioural context, field work was undertaken in three sites within the Kimberley. That was in Signet Bay, Roebuck Bay and Cone Bay. Um, this aspect is a, it's a smaller component of a much larger project that um, is being funded by the Australian Marine Mammal Centre. But um, it's all coming together so that we can apply this uh, Australia-wide for both snubbing and humpback dolphins. Now, because humpback and snubbing dolphins occurred in um, varying abundance in each of the different locations, uh, the fieldwork methodology was um, adopted appropriately depending on what species was there and, and in what sort of uh, densities. So in, in Signet Bay, we ended up uh, using boat-based surveys and relying on the Curtin University um, uh, acoustic logger. In Roebuck Bay, we essentially use Clipper Pearl's um, mothership, 35 metre pearling mothership um, that was permanently anchored out in Roebuck Bay there as a visual platform. Um, essentially had three acoustic recorders 
uh, temporarily anchored around there so that we can get the acoustic visual protections. Um, and then in Cone, by, Cone Bay, sorry, uh, we use Turtle Island uh, also as a visual platform. Um, and humpback dolphins uh, were often seen around the Barramundi sea farm cages there. And we were doing visual protections there. But in order to maximize our encounter rates for um, humpback dolphins, we also did boat based surveys um, and went further afield as well. Now, essentially, because they were in um, different densities, this is essentially reflected within the sampling effort as well. Um, whilst here in Sigma Bay, you can see the humpback dolphins and snubfin dolphins both occurred there. Humpbacks were in lower abundance, so we focused more on snubfins. Roebuck Bay was mainly focused on, uh, on snubfin, and Cone Bay was mainly focused on humpbacks. So what sort of behaviours are they doing? Well, I guess the, the main thing that we got out of this was um, here we see foraging and travelling were actually quite prominent behaviours. Um, they occurred in a large part of the actual activity budget. Uh, whereas the main difference though is Signet Bay here, rather than foraging being a prominent behaviour, we see socialising being a prominent behaviour. The take home message really though is that the behaviour, um, typically the, the types of sounds that the dolphins are making is also related to their behaviour. And so the type of behaviour that they're exhibiting in any one particular site um, greatly influences the effectiveness of PAM, as well as your choice of um, acoustic recorded limits and that sort of thing. So this data here though, I should note, um, this behavioural data relates only to the groups in which we had reliable visual and acoustic detections um, and data on that, and doesn't necessarily reflect, reflect the overall activity budgets of the dolphins within the larger study area. So again, that, that just goes to show that um, uh, acoustic um, recorded deployments is, is a fundamental critical component of um, the effectiveness of, of this. So if we get at what types of sounds that uh, were they actually using within the different behaviours, um, we see that they were most vocal um, per unit of time when socialising, um, and the whistles made up a large part of that component. Um, Travelling, basically burst pulses and clicks weren't recorded. Um, but whistles to a much lower degree. However, I guess the point about this is that whilst whistles um, make up their most vocal when socialising, so and whistles make up a large part of that, travelling was also a very prominent behaviour. So, if if you know the type of behaviour that they're exhibiting these vocalisations types isn't prominent, then that's also going to have a major effect on your detection rates. Uh, so, what are the types of sounds that they're actually producing? Um, you've got the whistles, burst pulses, and clicks. Now, a colleague of mine is actually looking at um, looking at species identification uh, using clicks and seeing whether or not you can differentiate between something and humpback dolphins um, just using the clicks that they're producing. So, I'm going to um, focus more on the whistles. Um, interestingly enough, there's more research that's been done on humpback dolphin acoustics than snubfins. Therefore, we actually expected to probably find fewer new vocalisation types of uh, humpbacks, but we actually were still finding uh, a couple of new vocalisations of whistles um, in the humpback dolphins, and even finding some for snubfin dolphins as well. It seems like there's more variation though in the types of whistles that humpbacks are producing in front of the snubfins, so they've got a, a much uh, more complex repertoire. Uh, but one of the other interesting components is that there seems to be at the moment the data is coming out that there is a higher mean frequency um, sorry, there's a higher mean minimum frequency, which is basically the, the lowest frequency that they're producing. That's higher for humpbacks and snubfins. So what that means for PAM is that potentially that's another contributing factor to being able to discriminate or differentiate between snubfin and humpback dolphins. So that's a good thing. Um, in the past, this is sort of spectrogram frequency and time. These are just a, a series of um, whistles that were collected in Cone Bay. Um, this is what we call a broadband recording. In the past, most of the research has actually been limited to um, sort of 20 kilohertz, which is really about the upper range of our own human hearing range. Um, we do know that harmonics extend beyond that, um, but by using broadband hydrophones, we're actually able to better capture the full frequency range of the types of um, sounds that the dolphins are using. 
So that's kind of critical if we're actually going to get a, a complete comprehensive idea of the repertoire. And that contributed to why we're finding potentially some new types of sounds as well, which I'll go on to. Um, here, by using broadband um, acoustic recorders, there's a series of whistles. Now, really, the main thing to talk about this is that, again, these are coming up on the um, higher end of the recording range that most other people have been using. So it's really important, I think, uh, for PAM in the future, for snuffing and humpbacks, that you probably will require that broader range in frequency um, when sampling or monitoring for them, which has its, um, I guess, it's the, there's consequences involved in that in relation to the amount of storage and duration that you can monitor for, which is a, a limiting factor in the field. Um, but yeah, this one in particular, the minimum frequency or the fundamental frequency, the, the basic, the lowest frequency that you have there of these sounds is around about a 19 and a half kilohertz. That actually hasn't been identified for SUSA, any species of SUSA before. Um, so that's something interesting that's come out of Kimberley data. So just in conclusion, um, as Chandra mentioned, I mean, PAM is good, passive acoustic monitoring is good uh, in the fact that it's becoming um, less and less expensive with the development of the technology for the acoustic recorders and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it can also be used for collecting and monitoring data over extended periods of time. And in high use areas, you don't actually, you know, it could be on the order of uh, weeks, maybe months that you might need to monitor for. In less dense areas, you might need to monitor for longer. But nevertheless, you can just potentially go to a field site, deploy, um, and then go away. And so, the cost associated with field work and that sort of stuff is, is, is usually less. Um, however, are we there for using PAN for snubfin and humpback dolphins specifically? Uh, probably not, not yet. Um, and one of the reasons is that we still kind of need to get that definitive answer in species identification. Um, and that's currently being resolved, especially for the clicks. And there's a little bit more work for the whistles. We do know we can discriminate uh, between the species based on whistles. But there's still a little bit more effort we need to do in relation to characterizing um, their full repertoire and then also developing effective uh, detection algorithms so that we can actually pull out all of the uh, sounds of interest that dolphins are making out of really large acoustic data sets which at the moment because of detection algorithms being able to pull that out aren't quite efficient yet there's a lot of manual um, amount of time that's required in order to validate exactly what we're seeing so once that's happened, um, you know, it's showing good prospect, I guess. And that's it. Thank you. Appreciate that, Josh. And thank you very much, everyone, for the patience. I realise it's running over your lunch times. Uh, we can have short questions if anyone wants to stay, or you can just see the speakers yourselves in the video. As I said before, we're going to follow this up by a sort of meeting with the... Um, presenters uh, just to talk about the management implications of the of the research findings at this stage. I don't know, do we should we just um, break it there and then let everyone uh, if, is there any particular questions people want to ask about Andy or any of the speakers from the Dolphin project at this stage? Any burning that you can't go on just one very quick one. The um, crocodiles. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. 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 That small range one that disappeared. Mm. Um, I don't know too much about crocodiles, but, but could it be that the really small ones have learned avoidance here, but as they get a bit bigger, are they preyed on by larger crocodiles? And so yeah, they, might, so. they might learn avoidance, and then yeah. once they get past that critical stage, they start to become more, more obvious? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, there, there's no question that probably the only, well, that's not true. At the hatchling it's almost even the official part of the birds. Yeah, once I get next slides, it's mostly the crocodiles, probably our crocodiles. So, yeah. um, it, it's a little bit of an anomalous result. We probably didn't expect to number squats of ISO and then you know, see what we're doing there. But yeah, I'm not going to give you the explanation of those ones for those reasons. Anything else? Um, as I said, we've, got, uh, we've actually got the final reports for both of those projects that have been reviewed at the moment. They'll then be going online on uh, the WOMG website. Plus all this presentation, if, if you would like to forward this on, we'll have this broken down into two separate presentations on the WOMG website as well. So, I have a question. I was just going to ask, uh, in the Northern Territory there were significant rain events like this wet season, but then they had a few years of huge big flooding. 
Do you think that that's actually changed the numbers from the point of view there's less competition as they've been able to disperse so they wouldn't have travelled to those areas? So up there, they're just everywhere, whereas sort of 30 years ago, yeah. you knew where they were, whereas now, like, I used to get one. Yeah, yeah, well, I just won't go in any. I didn't. <laughs> I think that's the whole of it. Um, Dry, wet seasons is another one of the major factors that, that plays out. So because when you get, and it's more, it's probably more applicable to the Northern Territory uh, uh, scenario because when you get the drier, wet seasons, um, less water means a lot of billabong stuff to dry up the stuff, and you get these big crocodiles all coming into the into the um, into the main systems, right? And then of course fighting goes on and all that sort of stuff. And so you have know, different rates and all and stuff. Yeah. So and then of course the really big wet, you often end up with. Um, that's the mortality in this because we get washed away and stuff as well. Well, in 97, it was like 70 kilometres water. Yeah. So you imagine it's not sticking to a water. No, that's right. It's literally, oh, yummy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's ready to go. Yeah. yeah. Um, otherwise, we're going to, as I said, follow up. If you're interested in talking to any of the presenters, I think uh, we can send the uh, emails to you, uh, as I say, that this presentation will be online, pass around to other people that might be interested, and their reports will be available to you. Thank you very much for coming in. If you'd like to just um, thank all the presenters.